very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. You're more than welcome to another episode, episode 72 of the Coffee at 11 show, brought to you by wigwam.ie SME peer support. Delighted to have you join us on a Tuesday morning here in lockdown heaven. It's also a delight for me to introduce a young man that I met very recently, and I've been so impressed by this young man's uh, view of, of the world that I thought we have to bring him in because he's definitely a person worth meeting. My pleasure, Mark. Maxwell, you're very welcome. Please say hello and show us your coffee mug. Thank you. Thank you very much, Colin. Uh, so my coffee mug isn't actually a coffee mug. I can't drink coffee because of my heart. It's a tea mug, and it's called Mr. T after the guy in the ATM. So it's a little, uh, little clever little play on words, but it's a tea mug as opposed to a coffee mug, for sure. And Mark, that'll do absolutely fine. Okay. You're more than welcome. Delighted, delighted. That's a lovely introduction, by the way. Okay, let me just tell you a little bit about Mark before we bring the man himself in, if that's okay. So obviously his name is Mark Maxwell. His business name is Grad Life. I'm, ex I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing about that. But as I always say to our guests, Mark, we can Google Grad Life. We can Google your, your profession. It's really the person in the seat that we want to meet. So uh, what does your business do? do does, it's a career guidance uh, a facility and podcast two years established yours truly himself mark is the only employee then it gets really interesting dare i say it whilst pursuing a career in rugby mark dropped dead mark dropped dead of a sudden cardiac arrest at age 18 he was extremely lucky to survive clearly he has survived and even more to survive without any severe brain damage uh, this episode has proven time and again to be a blessing for Mark as it continues to pay dividends as he lives his life to the fullest whilst pr pursuing a career in technology. And here's something, you know, I thought that was enough interesting stuff. When you hear this, right? Uh, something nobody knows about you. I was 40 minutes away from a foot amputation in 2016. Mother of divine, right? <laughs> this is going to be interesting. Young Mark Maxwell, you're more than welcome. Delighted to have you here. Before we get to the heart attack at age 18, bring us back to those early years, if you wouldn't mind. Give us a, introduce us to young Mark, please. Yeah, sure. So uh, I grew up in Betty Sam in County Meath, uh, one of two boys, and uh, was just a really sporty kid. I, I literally just wanted to play sports all the time. I um, was a very happy little gregarious kid. And when I was about, uh, I started playing rugby when I was four. By the time I was about nine, I realized I wanted to do it professionally. And uh, I was always pretty driven. So I actually used to get up before primary school and practice kicking and then, then go into primary school. And uh, then went over to a school that was really big on rugby and played a lot there. And a couple of the guys I played with went on to become professionals. And that was always my plan as well. But I wanted to go to Australia. And I had this opportunity to go to Australia uh, when I was 18. So I kind of took that. So I know I went really fast from 8 to 18 there, but to be honest, in between, there was nothing but sport. I just wanted to play sport, tennis and rugby at all times, um, and I was a, a happy little, happy kid, but probably a very intense uh, kid. Like, I was, I was, I didn't drink uh, until I was 18. I was pretty big on health, fitness, and just pushing myself in all areas, so, um, yeah, very one-dimensional, but I was happy. Yeah, no, I get that. I get that. And thanks for that. And no apology needed for skipping through. Uh, was academia your thing or was it all sport? Uh, I was fine at academics. I, I was very competitive and I used to be, I always wanted to do well in tests, uh, particularly in primary school. So um, I got, I'm happy to say I got 417 to leaving cert. So like good, but not, I'm no rocket scientist. Uh, that definitely came out of hard work more so than brains. Um, and I just, I got the, the course I wanted was commerce in UCD and that was 470. So that's all I ever needed for. So I was, I was a B student, I would say. Do you know what you are, or what you appear to be and what you seem to have been up through those years is very focused. You said earlier on, you're very driven and you clearly are up before primary school. I mean, you know, ladies and gentlemen, how many times have we <laughs> had to drag our children out of, out of bed <laughs> late to get them through? And your man's out kicking ball. Come here, um, who were your, your heroes back in the day? Was it Raj? Was it Johnny Sexton? Are we going way You back? will never forgive this. My hero as a kid was Johnny Wilkinson, the English out half. And he's the reason I didn't drink. I heard, oh, we've got an Englishman here. I heard that... Uh, I heard that he didn't drink. I heard he was huge on training and all that sort of stuff. And so he's the reason I didn't drink when I was 18. He's the reason I used to practice my kicking. And he's the reason uh, that he, he, I remember he said this quote, I don't know what I read or watched. And the, the quote was, the difference between the ordinary and the extraordinary is that little extra. And I remember that just became my mantra for life type of thing. And 
uh, I used to put my football boots beside my bed so that when I got up in the morning, my feet would go into the boot and I'd have to go out training. So um, that was all from Wilkinson. Wilkinson was my guy. And do you know what? Do you know what? A beautiful kicker, an absolutely beautiful kicker. And it was Real. some of the, some of the uh, English folk who joined us in the cafe who joined us regularly, delighted a couple of closet English folk in there and Michelle Barry shall remain nameless. But uh, it's, it's really great. Uh, and I saw, I saw Michelle, as soon as you, you mentioned that quote from Johnny Wilkinson, the book, the notebook came out, right? She's busy making <laughs> notes for the wonderful things people say in the cafe. Lovely stuff. And oh, look, look, there's the jersey. James Finnegan, we've got to bring you in. Stay where, James, leave it there. James, leave it there. You're coming in. I actually, James, I have a funny story. I got all I wanted for Christmas when I was about 10 was an English jersey with long sleeves because Wilkinson wore a long sleeve, everyone else wore a short sleeve. I got a long sleeve jersey. And then uh, the guys in school would have like beaten me up if I wore it. So I could never actually wear my English jersey anywhere. I'm, I'm down here in Kerry. So I don't wear it very often either. <laughs> I, you probably had to smuggle that in to Kerry. <laughs> exactly. Oh, listen, this is just joyful. Hey, right, James, we'll talk to you later. Thanks, sir. James, we'll talk to you later. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fabulous. Right, Mark, this is, this is great stuff. Um, so a long-sleeved England jersey for your 10th birthday. You're a brave man. Brave, brave man. Are you in Betty Sound at that stage, you were? Yeah, as in Betty Sound, I wore it. The day I got it, I wore it down to, uh, down to the tennis club when the lads all started hitting balls at me. So, like, it was literally from day one. It was... <laughs> Uh, look, it's great. It's great stuff. <coughs> Kathy, is Kathy Mara still with us? Um, uh, yes, Kathy. There's, there's a, in, in case you never picked up on it, Kathy, there's a rivalry between our two nations. Uh, slight rivalry. Um, and uh, it's interesting when the, when the lines get blurred like this. Very interesting. Great stuff. But by the way, you know, let's, let's, uh, let's honour beauty and, and hard work and extraordinary. And Johnny Wilkinson, uh, you know, he, he embodies all of that. So. Happy days, happy days. I love, I love, you know, I love professionalism. I love anybody stepping out and being the best they can be in whatever mm -hmm. field, so and whatever nationality. That that's irrelevant. Okay, happy days, right? Very exciting. Are we down under at this stage? Are we in Australia? Uh, yeah, eighteen moved down to Australia uh, a couple of weeks after the leaving cert. Um, I didn't do. I wasn't interested in sixty-year holidays or anything. I was never big on that stuff. Uh, I just wanted to. I like want to train basically and went down to Sydney uh, got the keys of the gym and the school and started training uh, seven hours a day so I'd get up at seven do hill sprints the, the routine is important so I get up at seven would do hill sprints come in I used to have uh, six eggs and 12 Weetabix for breakfast and um, then go out and do an upper body weight session and then come in have protein and creatine have a massive lunch then do a lower body weight session then go and coach rugby and then, um, and then would do like study supervision for the students type of thing. I was working at secondary school. And if I didn't go out, I would uh, set an alarm for 2 a.m. and wake up at 2 and do a core and have a protein shake and go back to bed at 2.30 because I heard my, favorite, my new favorite player, David Polcock, another manic trainer. Yeah, he, I heard he did that, so I was like, if he does it, I'll do it. So I did that. And then if I did go out, which I did three or four nights a week, I would drink. I started drinking at 18. I would drink. And like, and like any stupid 18-year-old, I'd get really drunk, but I'd still get up at 7 for the hill sprints. And um, I did that every day. And I became, I was 120 kilograms by the time uh, I went. I gained 15 kilograms in about seven months and was the fittest, fastest I'd ever been. Um, so that brought me up to Christmas 2010. And I was literally the fittest, most athletic person my age that I knew. Really fascinating stuff. I was, uh, I started to smile when you said, did you say six eggs and 12 Weetabix every morning? Holy moly. Yeah, I would have taken in about 6,000 calories a day. I used to train till I threw up and stuff. Incredible, incredible. And uh, Gaston from the movie, um, remember the, the, the Disney movie, he came to mind. It was a bell, Beauty and the Beast, Gaston in there, because he's lashing down all these eggs to be big as a barge was his thing. Um, success leaves clues. Another note I wrote down, success leaves clues. You've been out there looking for extraordinary heroes to follow. And you simply said, if he does that, I'll do it. End of story. No, no discussion. So just fantastic stuff. Absolutely beautiful. By the way, for an elf like me, what's 120 kilos in stones and pounds? Uh I'd say about 18 and a half, about 18 and a half stone. But I was a sprinter as well. I was 11 seconds, 100 meters. So um, my, my, big, my big problem, this is how like 
basically stupid I was. My big problem at that age was that I wasn't Polynesian. I wanted to be Polynesian like all the biggest rugby players. So uh, I grew a rat's tail. I bleached the back of my head, and then I tried to get to 120. So <laughs> yeah, it was uh, well, a vast uh, little ecosystem I was living in. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Uh, Kathy Merrick uh, coaches cross-country running for girls, so she's well impressed with your 11 second 100 meters. I mean, you know, ladies and gentlemen, can you imagine this man, you know, 120 kilos, and you're at the end of those 100 meters and he hits you? <laughs> <laughs> Not much argument there, right? Okay, okay. It seems like it's going to get serious. Yeah, so I, I stopped the story at Christmas 2010 because we were in Australia working the Australian school system, so you've got... The summer is uh, November to January, February type thing. So their summer holidays start in December. So for our summer break, we wanted to go to New Zealand, myself and three other Irish guys I was, I was living with, three good friends. And we went down to New Zealand. And I, as I say, I was fit as healthy as, as could be. And um, went to Auckland, went up north for a couple of days, did some jet skiing, great fun. And then back down and left Auckland one morning on the 7th of January, 2011 and um, left off and was on a bus to a place called Rotorua and I decided to go for a nap and a couple of minutes into the nap the guys noticed that I was snoring really really loudly and they thought I was just kind of taking the piss and trying to uh, draw attention to them and that sort of thing and uh, then they realized they, they, they threw something at me it bounced off my head I didn't wake up then they realized when they looked closer that I was going blue so I was actually pretty much blue by the time they realized something was wrong and then because I, I, I built up obviously quite a frame and my body wasn't holding it up. So I was kind of like really hunched over and I was breathing like this. I was like, <gasps> and then I dropped back down because my body was just folding over itself. And then they said, oh God, something's really wrong. So they stopped the bus. No word of a lie. It was the bus driver's first day on the job working for that tour company. Stopped the bus. They carried me off. And they started to give me CPR. So uh, I was taking protein and creatine at the time, but I couldn't take steroids because I, was, I wanted to be a player. Whereas one of the guys didn't want to be a player, so he did take steroids. And he gave me CPR. And he, um, he broke my rib. He just went straight down and like cracked my rib. So every morning when I wake up to this day, I have to crack my rib there. And because um, he, he pushed it in too far. So this guy gave me CPR. I was actually dead on the ground for 20 minutes. And uh, an ambulance came along and they gave me six shocks of an external defibrillator, which you gear up and shock. And uh, th that didn't work. I still, there was still no sign of life. They put me in an ambulance and they kind of agreed that I did have a lot more padding than most people because of all the, the training. And so they gave me a few more shocks and they gave me, they ended up giving me 13 shocks all told. And that got me going. Now I had life, but they were sure that my brain was going to be fried from all of the extra shocks. So they put me into an induced coma where they just bring down your body temperature and I stayed in that induced coma for a week. Uh, the poor guys, like I always say, I had the easiest role in this whole play because I was asleep. Whereas the guys had to deal with their friend dying in front of them, the poor guys had to carry me off the bus, like this sort of thing. So then the worst part was like, the only kind of part I've never really joked about is they had to call my family and tell them. And I can't even imagine how hard that would have been for everyone on those calls. And like a, the, the family powerless, the, the friends having to deliver that news. And uh, they flew down, my parents flew down from uh, Dublin via Hong Kong, whatever, a day or two days later. And they uh, went by Hong Kong. When they got to Hong Kong, they called the hospital to say, how's, how's he doing? And this was literally a, a day or two after. And they said, you're still going to be pretty much coming down to pick up the body. There's no sign of life and it's, it's not looking good. So... It was really, really looking sad for a long time. Um, I don't know if anyone on the call is, is religious. I got into it. Uh, I've kind of fallen off it again, but I got really into it after because I heard this story. My old school has a church in it, and they all uh, got together. Guys, everyone from my year, probably the year below, the year above, a lot of people who knew me, and a lot of parents, past pupils, everything. They all got together in, in the church and had this big mass for me. And none of the lads are religious but they all say it was a very strange feeling in the, in the room. And during that, as they were getting that strange feeling in the room, on the other side of the world, I just took this turn in the, uh, in the coma for the better. And two days later, I woke up. So, uh, yeah, it was a crazy time. But then when I did wake up, I did have short-term memory issues. So they put a pacemaker and a defibrillator into me. 
Yeah, we get we 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 get there. We get there. Hang on a sec. Don't 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 gloss over something as momentous as you dying in front of us, in front of your friends for twenty minutes, and uh, and all of uh, you know, we were all in that bus with you, just there. You just brought us mm. through it, hair raising stuff, and uh, you know we can all imagine what was going through their their heads at the start. A couple of young fellows throwing stuff at your head because they t- thought you were taking the piss, as you said yourself. And, uh, and then it got serious and got very serious. And those phone calls that they would have had to make, as you say, tough on everybody in that call, the guys themselves and, of course, your family. And then this mom and dad stop in Hong Kong and they're told, you know, keep on coming, but you're picking up your son's body. <sighs> heavy stuff, heavy stuff. The, relig- the religion thing is interesting. Um, you know, I, I grew up in, in Catholic Ireland, so therefore I'm Catholic by, by um, I was christened Catholic. Um, but I always say I had no choice because had I been born in Baghdad, I probably wouldn't be. Let's put it like that. I, you know, I believe religion as opposed to spirituality is more geographical in its beginning. Uh, but I think what we're hearing here, Mark, dare I say it, is a spirituality. Uh, you know, re- religion is a separate thing to spirituality. It's a, it's, a, it's a husk, if you like, around a relationship with a higher power. And I think that's what everybody uh, got together in that church and connected with. And there's nobody on the show here, I think, in the cafe would uh, would um, question, but that had an impact all the way around the other side of the world. So, uh, so we're delighted. We're delighted. We're delighted to have you here. Delighted that you're able to be here. Well done, you, my friend. Right. Hopefully, yeah, it was a bit of a, bit of a journey. You're awake. You're awake now. What happens next? Uh, if I told you, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. You won't believe me, but this is what happened. So. Um, they had to check for brain damage, and mom comes down. And I'm, I'm a great man for an inappropriate joke, but this is the best inappropriate joke I think I've ever done. So um, mom is, comes down, and uh, they're checking for brain damage. So she said, the doctor says, look, Mrs. Max, so we're going to have to ask a couple of questions. She said, let me ask him. He's my baby kind of thing. And she's like, okay, just ask him his name. And my French exchange student, I always remember his details from Toulouse. So she said, what, okay, honey, what's your name? I said, Francois. And she said, oh, my God. And then she turned to the doctor and she said, uh, he said, ask one more, one more. It's going to be OK. OK, baby, what's your address? Where do you live? And I said, Rue saint Catherine, Toulouse, France. And she started kind of crying. I said, mom, mom, I'm kidding. It's Mark from Betty's Town. And I said, let's get out of here and go to Dunnigan's, which is a steakhouse in Betty's Town. That's the only thing I wanted to do. And... Um, She'd never forgiven me for that. But like that kind of lifted the spirit in the room and the lads came in and we had a pizza. We watched the tennis. We, we were meant to be at the tennis at the Melbourne Cup with the, the Australian Open in Melbourne. I obviously screwed that up. So um, we watched the tennis. We had, we had great fun. But underneath, it was, it was pretty hard. So uh, unfortunately, like Dermot, one of the other guys who also wanted to be a, a pro player, uh, had to come in and tell me that I couldn't play rugby again. I started crying. And then... Um, a few minutes later, whatever, a couple of hours later, he comes back in and he said, well, how are you feeling about the rugby thing? And I said, yeah, God, I can't wait to get back into it. And he said, no, no, you can't. We told you, you can't play again. And then I started crying. And that had happened like seven or eight times before it actually got into my head. So, um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was a really strange time around like that sort of stuff. But I, I didn't have the short-term, that short-term memory problem persisted for actually two months. So I, had to, I got the pacemaker defibrillator put in. I flew back to Ireland to recover. I had very low energy. I couldn't exercise, which was killing me. And also, that was like my whole... I basically exercised as a full-time job. So that was the, all this time back. And I need to, I'm the type that needs to do something. And so I figured... And I, I actually... like I, I, I think I was an idiot of an 18-year-old in a lot of ways. But this was a good move. I, um, I realized as an athlete, that if I wanted to get bigger arms, I'd do curls, bigger legs, I'd do squats, whatever. And that was a good resistance training. And I realized then that I had a short-term memory problem and I had time. And I thought resistance for short-term memory would be a language. And I always wanted to learn Spanish. So I bought this online Spanish program and learned Spanish. And um, now I speak fluent Spanish. And I went traveling to South America a couple of years ago on my own and uh, got on like fully with all this. I lived with a bunch of Argentinians in Sydney and uh, they taught me RG Spanish, so that's the kind of flavor I go for. But um, it's, yeah, it's like that's, uh, as Colin said in the intro, it keeps paying dividends. It honestly just keeps paying dividends, this stuff. It's unbelievable. But uh, yeah, no, I'm going to pause there because there's a few ways you could go, so I'll leave it to you to try it. 
No, look, it's uh, it, it it's quite fascinating, you know. And when you when you when you come out of having been dead for twenty minutes, and then you said, "By the way, you're not going to believe this." <laughs> I was thinking, <laughs> "Where are you going to go next?" Your poor mother. I hope she clattered you for that Francois joke, <laughs> right? Clattered you. Um, my goodness. Okay. Uh, and uh, Eamon Smith is actually in Betty's town as we speak, so uh, he's put, gave the thumbs up to Donigans there. Uh, so whenever you're that neck of the woods, you guys hook up and go for a steak. Sounds fabulous. Okay, look, it, it, it really is a fascinating story. Um, what I'm most impressed by, Mark, if I may say, is that it never knocked your ability to work and focus out of you. You know, you are you. And there was all that grounding. That's why it's important when we come into the cafe to get to know you at an early age, because we were introduced to that hardworking, focused, resilient young boy that, you know, has to have been key to your survival, if that makes sense. Had we not known that, it might have just been a lucky fluke that you made it through. But uh, I think there's more to it than that. Um, and then the fact that you took, you know, resistance training uh, from the body and threw it into the mind, learning Spanish while you're recovering from you know, having died. Um, so quite, quite incredible. Um, what has happened in terms of your career? Clearly rugby's off the cards, at least playing rugby. Are you still involved in sport? No. So rugby, yeah. Rugby was tough because it was, I, I don't even watch rugby anymore. I haven't actually watched rugby and I, I didn't watch the Lions, didn't watch the World Cup, nothing like that. I, I simply don't, I have no interest in it. I have some play, friends who play it for Leinster and Ireland, but I just don't watch it. And it's kind of, people ask me why, and I, I kind of you used to love it so much. And I'd say, well, imagine if you were the girlfriend that you loved so much, and then you have to watch her kissing other guys every week or whatever. And it's kind of like that. Like, I just, uh, like, I don't like going to rugby games. I, I couldn't go to them at the start because you just want to play, and it just hurts. Like, it's just crap. So um, you kind of just crack on with it. But like, mom in particular, but a couple of people would always say, oh, you, like, you've dealt with this so well type of thing. But... I've always said, what else was I going to do? Like, there was no real, like, you, you could just sit in the couch, kind of drinking or whatever, but, like, nobody really wins there. So, um, yeah, I got really into reading. I never, I was total jock in school, so I, I would never read a book. But uh, I got really into reading to the point where, uh, in 2016, and then I was on track this year until COVID, I read a book every week. So I tend to read, um, I tend to read probably 30 books a year on average, I'd say. And I've gotten a huge amount out of that. Uh, I was starting to think my brother, three years older, had started working in finance and he seemed to have a cool job, a cool life in London. So I started reading about finance then uh, straight away and I was reading about all the derivatives and hedge funds and stuff. So that kind of became my new North Star. I was like, I'm just going to have a good career, make a lot of money and have a bit of fun. So and travel. I always wanted to keep traveling. So um, yeah, like to, to fast forward a little bit, went to UCD. Uh, did commerce, then got a job at an investment bank, but and moved back down to Sydney to, to work in that bank. So it was a really cool thing. But that whole time, one conversation that stands out is I was probably about 19, and I was in uh, I was in my house in me, and my mom's twin, her my aunt Ruth came over, <clears throat> and I started going out loads and drinking loads. Never drugs. I can't do drugs with my heart, but and to be honest, I wouldn't be that interested in them anyway. But uh, Ruth came over. She said, you're going out a fair bit for a guy who just had a bloody heart attack. And I said, yeah, well, like, it doesn't really matter too much. I'm going to be, whatever way I worded it, so I'm going to be gone by the time I'm 30 anyway. And um, she was really taken aback. And she was like, what do you mean? And then we kind of got into it. And I always had this mindset that I wouldn't make it to 30. And so that, like, I was dealing with, uh, everyone kind of freaks out after school and college and what are you going to do and friends and interests and whatever. But I was really dealing with mortality in a very heavy way. And uh, that, was, that was pretty tough. I would say that was a kind of psychological recovery. Physical recovery took a year. Uh, psychological recovery then took probably five years, I would say. But then, um, yeah, it, 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 it has come in waves, I think, since. But what I'm saying is that the, the core theme of my life between, say, 18 to 24 while it was kind of about figuring out careers, more getting to grips with mortality and how, to, to what extent I was going to allow it to drive the bus for me. Uh, because it's a very, very, it's, it's the best thing to drive the bus for you in a lot of ways. It gets you to do so much uh, that you wouldn't otherwise do, either through courage or interest or whatever. So it's actually, it, it, I've, I allow mortality to drive the bus for me a lot but I realized that I could go too far with it as well. And that was interesting. 
Wow, 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 wow. Very powerful stuff. Very powerful and, and deep, which, by the way, probably comes from all that reading. One book a week since 2016, average 30 books a year. That, that's exceptional. That's, we're back to extraordinary. That's absolutely extraordinary. Uh, but it's forming the young man that we've seen. And uh, I have to admit, you know, hearing about your, your mother's twin sister, Aunt Ruth, uh, how that must have affected her, that you basically said, well, I'm checking out of here. I'm expecting to check out of here at age 30. It appears to me like that has changed, right? That that's not on the cards anymore. Uh, you're living life to the full, and uh, and you're you're making a difference. And I, that's the part I want to get to in a moment, if I may. I want to I want to get to this, um, you know, grad life thing and and what you're hoping to do with that, because all of it is formed by those uh, those early years and that journey you've been on. Uh, the analogy you used about you know, you're in love with a girlfriend and she's going out with somebody else and you have to sit there watching her kissing somebody every week versus, you know, to, to, in terms of your your reason for not watching rugby. I mean, that that's so clear. So clear. Everybody gets that. Everybody gets that. It's not, it's, it's just it's very, very powerful um, um, phraseology. So thank you for that Lo lovely picture there. Um, right. Uh, qu quite an amazing journey and I knew it would be. Um, before we go into grad life and all that stuff and what you're doing as a result of your journey, uh, tell us about the foot in 2016. Uh, the foot in 2016 was, so I was down in Australia, but all my Irish friends were home and we wanted to do a holiday together because I never saw them. So we decided to meet halfway. We went to Thailand and um, I drove. It's funny. We were talking about, I think it was before the show, we were talking about control. I've got this control thing as well. So I'm really scared of heights. Like I, I got really scared on an eighth story roof in Spain last week. The security guard had asked me to calm down. I was freaking out because I'm not in control of the height. But then if I go like tobogganing or anything like that, or like driving, uh, like mountain bikes or whatever, I'll be nuts. Like I'll take all the risk. So we rented a couple of motorbikes in Thailand. And because I'm at the wheel, I was nuts. And I, I went off track and did a couple of jumps and then fell, like snotted myself and got cuts all down my uh, my left side, and um, went into the sea thinking that the salt would clear out the cuts because in Australia that would be true. But in Thailand, you're swimming with monkeys and it's not true because there's so many diseases in the water. I uh, think it's James I can see laughing there. And um, got all these diseases, woke up the next morning and my foot was enormous and I was shivering. And Dermo, the same guy who was with me at the heart thing, he was like, oh, not again. So he... <laughs> He gets me out of the room. He puts me in a wheelbarrow because he can't carry me. And he wheels me through the town in Thailand at like five in the morning. We, to, we literally were throwing stones at the window of the doctor's house to get him out of bed to come down and look at my foot. He wheels me into the hospital. He put me in the hospital. Then like 40 minutes later, they said, I nursed my left. She said, Mark, your temperature is so high that we're going to need... Uh, we're going to need to give you some pills. We need to call your heart doctor to see what pills you're allowed to take. So that was one problem. Then the doctor to my right said, you've got septicemia crawling through your left foot so quickly that we might need to take it off to stop it spreading to your heart. And like, it's all hilarious now, but I was crying at the time. I was totally freaking out. And um, it actually ended up being the best. I was in, I was in Thailand hospital for four, day, four nights, five days. The best five days. I read On the Road by Jack Kerouac, if, if you guys have ever heard of the book or the author. Unbelievable. And like I was all into the, these like kind of coming of age, transformative novels and stuff. So Kerouac was just the bomb for me. And they all thought, I'm six foot five. So all these Thai people thought I was this like monument. So people would come in just to meet me, take a photograph and that sort of thing. It was ridiculous. And the only thing I was allowed to eat was toast. And for whatever reason, their toast was unbelievable. So I was eating like a loaf of toast every day and then just being stood up to take pictures with tiny little Thai people and like, and reading Kerouac. It was unbelievable. And then my friends will come in, tell me all the crack from the night before. It was, it was, it ended, I know this sounds ridiculous, but it was a great holiday. Just being in that bed and having people come in and have the crack and reading Kerouac and it was, it was mad. Oh, um, Mark, yeah, Mark, Mark. It all was okay. Mark, 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 Mark. <laughs> You know, I'm sorry, but we've been breaking our sides laughing here at your woes. Um, Self-inflicted somewhat in, in the second time, you know, going nuts on the bike and then swimming in the sea with monkeys. You know, just staggering stuff. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to the movie. That, that's all. I'm looking forward to the movie. Look, it, it, it's it's incredible. And poor Dermo. My heart goes out. We're going to have Dermo on the show here, right? We've got to get Dermo's side of the story. Because poor Dermo. There's a guy who's 
you know? Is he still friends with you? Does, does he still call you? I, to- I was talking to him last night. He's over in Canada. He's living it up over in Canada. And uh, he should be playing rugby for Ireland, but um, but he's, he's over in Canada hanging out instead. He's over in Canada avoiding you, I'd say. <laughs> Dare I say it? <laughs> Excuse me. But look, it's great. It's, uh, it's an unbelievably wild journey, and you're only 28. Unbelievably wild journey, you're only 28. You're definitely one to watch, young man. And uh, you've got a, a new crew here rooting for you in whatever way we can. Because, yeah, see that? Go, go Janie. You know, really, we, that, that's, what, that's what we're about here. We're, we're looking for inspiring people to nudge them along on their journey so they continue to inspire people. So does that bring us to grad life, or is that where we're headed? First, thank you very much for all you just said. Um, and if people want to look at my Facebook, if you type in Mark Maxwell Google into Facebook, you'll see my cover photo is me. They had to get a bigger wheelbarrow for me and all the bags for the rest of the trip that we were leaving. So there are, you can see a picture of, of Dermo in particular wheeling me around. Um, so yeah, to, that does take me to grad life because I went into work in that investment bank. That had been my dream for whatever, five years. And it was like big money, living in Sydney, living on the beach. It was, it was kind of like the picture perfect thing. And um, I was crap at it and I hated it. And I was on an XL for like 16 hours a day and the people weren't friendly. And I, was, I wasn't on a grad program. I was the youngest on the floor by like, on the training floor by like eight or nine years or something. And it was just not nice. And I moved to Sydney on my own and I was lonely and all sorts of stuff. It was like everyone thought I was down there living the dream. And on paper I was, but really I wasn't happy. And I started to feel all these things I'd never felt before, like things that just weren't on a young person's radar, like conflict of values, and, you know, I needed to figure that out. I, I, was, I remember walking to the gym one day, and I was like, why do I hate this so much? Like, it's, it's not rational to hate it this much. And I started breaking it down and writing about it. I'd always used writing as, uh, I, like, you know, being a kind of macho 18-year-old, I didn't really talk about my feelings too much. So I always used to write about it after the heart stuff, to the point where I'd write for probably an hour every day, just emptying my mind out. And that, that's something I still do to this day, probably down to, like, 10 minutes every couple of days. But... Um, writing was very much to hear. So I was writing about why I hated the bank, came down to values. I wasn't, my, my own values weren't in line with those of the organization. Uh, the nature of the work, I wasn't playing to my strengths at all. Like I have no attention to detail. And like the bank is all about attention to detail. I wasn't dealing with people. That's the only thing I know and love. Like I, I love working with, with other folks. So all these different things. And uh, I realized, so it was the values thing. There was a strengths and weakness thing going on. There was the mortality thing, life is short, I'm really going to be on this trading floor for the next 50 years type of thing. And those two experiences combined, hating the bank and being disillusioned with my dream and mortality and the hard stuff, both caused me to look at the whole graduate life thing uh, very differently to a lot of people and really look at it on a much deeper level. And a couple of friends have called me up saying, oh, I don't like my job either. And I'd be like, why do you think that is? I've thought about this a lot, like tell me. And kind of having good chats with them and realizing I was adding a bit of value to them kind of got me thinking about it. And um, at the same time, sorry, I'm gonna, the, the timing's all over the place here, but I joined Google after the bank. I was in the bank for two years. I started working for Google. I was asked to tell my story once to a bunch of 20 people. They said it was good. Then it was a bunch of 40 people, a bunch of 60 people. And then I actually ran, I, I emceed uh, the ANZ conference for Google, the annual conference with like 1,200 people interviewed the CEO of Domino's and told my story and all sorts of stuff. And after that, people came up to me and said, you're good at this. You should do this for a living. So that was on Thursday. Saturday morning, I uh, set up a website on Wix. And then Sunday morning, I set up Google Ads. And that cost me about $100. And then two weeks later, I got a phone call from a company offering me two grand to do an event for them. And I was like, two grand, $100, this is a business. And uh, off I went and did more and more of that stuff. So I, was, I re- realized, hang on, I've got this communication thing going now where I can tell stories and, and, work, and host events, whatever. And I've got all this stuff going on in my head about the grad life. So, and I was just so, because I was so crap at my job. I used to always ask other people about this. I was like, are you crap at your job too? And I would learn so much about what other people were doing that I was like, I might as well record these things and then got the Grad Life podcast going. So that all, it all happened together. Like life is such a mad mess. But then in hindsight, you're like, of course, all that fits in and makes sense. And uh, it was always going to work out. It's great stuff. Great stuff. I was watching the Buddha bus all around, rapturous silent applause here in the cafe for you. Uh, Just 
Great stuff, great stuff. And just on that point, by the way, life is one big mess and we can only ever join the dots looking backwards, which is, uh, the, I suppose, a bit of a tragedy, but uh, but it's nice to do. It's nice to look backwards and say, well, that, that actually led to that and that led to that and that, that led to the other. Uh, great stuff. And so Grad Life, what do you hope Grad Life will do or what is it doing for graduates? Uh, I'm at the risk of offending a couple of people here, two groups of people. But I'm going to say the two things I want to achieve with it. One, I, I wanted to achieve this. I wanted to get young people to think about what they want to do and not what they feel they should do. So to use a massive exaggeration, all students in Ireland tend to go and become bloody accountants, whether they want to or not. Like, it's just this massive trend. It's insane. And they do it out of pure security. And it's a defensive play. And I want people to make offensive plays. Like, they're young, take a bit of risk, have a bit of crack, like, go and enjoy it, try something. And I want to instill that in them. And I tell them, I'm like, you've no idea how crap at my first job I was. And I wish I went and tried this other thing. And like, it'll definitely, it'll, it'll be in your best interest one way or the other to do it. So kind of giving that message is one. And then two, at the risk of offending people, is like guidance counselors in schools tend to have been in schools for like 30 years. They haven't been in the working world. Hi, miss, I want to work for Google. She's going to be like, okay, like, what do, you, do they code or what, what needs to happen? I don't know. Whereas I've actually worked in the work in the, the modern tech business world. So I think my advice may be more updated. And then thirdly, uh, there tends to be a bit of a barrier with people because the parents have come up to me and said, hey, will you come over and talk to my son, talk to my daughter, like they don't listen to me. And they might do it because the parents is way older or there's a certain role. Uh, and the, this is a very weird thing. I always used to ask my parents for a younger brother. And I think I always wanted to be an older brother. So I'm able to come in with grad life from that like older brother angle and give what I hope is somewhat sage advice to people standing more like a peer than, uh, than an adult. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yes, indeed. Thumbs up and build of us everywhere. Wonderful. Uh, do, do you know what? You'd make a cool older brother. You're making a cooler older brother for uh, lots of people through grad life. Amazing stuff. Absolutely amazing. And such a refreshing young voice to have in the cafe. We've had some, we've had 71 other wonderful people worth meeting and you're number 72 and it's just a joy. So thank you for being here. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks for surviving, by the way. <laughs> to, I'll to, do my best. I'll, I'll keep going for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, do that. Do that. And uh, pass our best to Dermo. We'll all be uh, wishing Dermo the very best into the future. Right, come here, just a joy, just a joy. We're going to go to Q&A and our comment from the floor in just a second, if that's okay, Mark. Uh, thank you for being here. Before we do, though, what are you, what's Mark Maxwell taking from COVID? Taking from COVID, uh, to be honest with you, there's, there's a fair bit. Uh, I've been kind of like really into work recently. I moved to London to, to set up the office there, moved into management. Like, it's all been very grown up. And... I live, uh, my brother's 31 and I kind of live a more grown up life than him even. It's, it's kind of ridiculous. So what I realized, because COVID presented me with this opportunity of you can go and work anywhere in the world, you can do whatever you want type of thing. And it was overwhelming actually. And I was thinking, I've been living the life of a fucking 35 year old and I'm only 28 and life is short and I need to get a bit more youth back into it. So um, it's really kind of challenged me in that way to think, okay, all options open. What, what would you actually do? And I talk about this in the book I wrote, actually, about when you're given an essay to write and it has no title, you can write about anything, people tend to struggle more than when you're just given the title. And I found myself in that problem. And it really made me, encourage me to just kind of take the reins again and really think for myself, what am I trying to get out of this whole thing? As opposed to just uh, belligerently carrying on on this course because people are telling me it's a good course, if that makes sense. It makes, it makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you for that, Mark. Uh, there's a couple of people I want to connect you with in the cafe, if I may. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go all out here on a limb. But uh, Kathy Mera, uh, she coaches high school girls in uh, cross-country running. And I just think Mark's story, dare I say it, I've said this a few times in the show, I think Mark's story might be one that would be worth sharing with the girls. And perhaps there's a connection opportunity for you there. I think your story would resonate hugely in that space you could zoom in perhaps dare i say it into new hampshire and uh, and ha have a conversation just putting it out there the other lady is jamie lazar jamie lazar change makers uh uh edx Dunleary, and it's the next generation so again may i suggest you people find a way to connect and then evelyn mcaleer has come in uh evelyn good to see you again from the county tyrone and evelyn has come in because uh, she's got a um 
an interesting, I won't say morbid, but an interesting uh, uh, interest in, in these near-death experiences. So you may expect a, a conversation with Edel, if that's okay. Great stuff. Lovely, lovely. I love this cafe. I love it. Right. Okay, Mark, we're going to go to comment or Q&A from the floor. Who wants, who wants in? Who wants in? Evelyn, Evelyn McAleer. There we go. Thank you very much, Colm. And I got in here at the right time today. Everything's always the perfect time. We just come in at the nick of time. Well, uh, buenos dias, Mark, and uh, muchas gracias para su tiempo. Okay, <laughs> hablo en poco en español. Um, tengo, una pregunta, tengo una pregunta para ti. Sí, sí so, vamos. Okay, okay. <laughs> Yeah, por ahora hablamos en inglés, por favor. Okay. <laughs> Look how fancy I am. That was very good. <laughs> Thanks. Who is me Espanol? Mark, I want to ask you, please, when you had that experience, when you were come off the coach and you went, you died, what did you experience? Because I was waiting to hear that there. What did you feel? Or did you feel you were sleeping? As a lot of people said, they felt a peace or something more after. So that's what I'd like to hear from you, please. I always disappoint people uh, with this answer. And I hear of other people, and I think there's a lot of liars out there who have had similar things because they, they seem to make something up, unless they just had a different thing to me. And um, my answer is nothing. When you die, you're dead. And I actually use that line all the time because I'm not, like, I wouldn't be very scared of death, to be honest, anymore, because I know that you don't know what happens. You know what I mean? And like, just to give you like some, some uh, brain food for the day, like people think when a young person dies, it's really sad and it's really hard for them because they missed out on the rest of life. They don't know. Like they had all of life as far as they're concerned. And so you literally, you don't know. Like there's no, there's no experience. But one thing I will say is that I was asleep when it happened. So maybe the people who were awake had an experience. I'm very grateful that I wasn't. It would be cool. It would be cool to say and to look back on whatever I would have gone through. But I, I think it would have haunted me because I actually went through a phase of post-traumatic stress seven years later in 2017 where I would have nightmares and all sorts of stuff about my heart going really fast. And I, I, I thank God that I didn't have any real scarring memory of going into that slump because I think that would stay with someone for a long time. I actually think, uh, yeah, I think that would have been really hard. So it's not an interesting answer, but I'm, I'm very grateful that I didn't have it. No, well, thank you for your answer, because it's a different answer than the normally receive, if I'm honest. So that's a very, di you're the first person to have a different answer for that. So thank you. Yeah, Maybe you weren't I, really I, dead. I, you're only pretending you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Welcome to the cafe, Mark. Oh, yeah. You'll you, you hear it. Dead <laughs> as it comes out here, that's for sure. Now, listen, thank you for that. Both. Thank you for reading. Great question, because Evelyn definitely has a, an interest in this area and there's something special going to come up soon in relation to that. Evelyn, thank you for being here. And again, thank you for the honest answer. You know, that's just your experience. So yeah, we're, we're delighted you're here. That's the most important thing. Evelyn, pleasure. Absolutely. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Princess Shelley, in your own time, what's been going on in the cafe, please? <laughs> it's a very busy cafe. Very, very busy cafe. Mark, you are remarkable. <laughs> like, you are just like we've had so many guests in the cafe who we say there's a book in you there's a book and i thought very early on this is a blockbuster epic movie it is just i i want the movie to be made and as well you're one of the only guests you've been chatting away throughout the comments so i may end up reading out one of your comments you're multitasking you're you're all things to all people and you're just amazing you're, you're out on your own I, 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 think, I, I think you're adorable um let me find this here if i can um, there's an awful lot of comments we started off the comments this morning ladies and gentlemen with some some gratitude for the role that Eamon kicks us off each morning and um, before we go live for the replay and um, he kicks us off and there was some lovely comments of gratitude thanking Eamon for getting us already for what was sure enough to become another astounding um interview in our cafe so there was some lovely gratitude there and then James kicked off, you showed us your tea mug, and he said a warrior's drink. So uh, that was James popping in with that. Thank you for that, James. And then we, we went to the, the Johnny Wilkinson, your hero, and Eamon was saying that he overcame enormous paralyzing fear and anxiety demons as well to become the great 
the, the great leader that he is and the great player that he is. Um, so um, he just thought it tied in very nicely with um, what you had said. And I had written down, like Colm said, that difference between the extraordinary and, and the ordinary is that little extra. And I loved that, really, really loved that. Um, so yeah, so that's like like Sarah was saying, good man, and absolutely agreed with what James had said. Kathy, who is as Colm introduced you a moment ago, Kathy has this. Uh, she's a coach and a mentor to a girls running group, and she said you mentioned eleven seconds. Um, one hundred meters is very fast. So um, I think Kathy was impressed with that. Um, so thank you for that. Then, Mark, we moved on to the really scary part of your story. We were all we were all kind of holding our breath and waiting to hear, even though you're standing in front of us or sitting in front of us today. We knew you made it, but we were all on the edge of our seats, you know. And um, Sarah Ward, who joins us each and every day, said, wow, scary stuff, goosebumps. And um, that's true, Sarah, like that, you know, we meet these interesting people, but we were all sitting there with these goosebumps. And when you mentioned about all the people in mass, um, Eamon said, never underestimate the power and potential of guided intention and focus from a place of unconditional love from so many friends and family. So just the pure power, thank you for that Eamon, for having everybody all in the one place, wanting the one thing, you know, um, and look what it did from all the opposite side of the planet. James was interested, we might have a show of hands, um, mine can't go up, how many in the cafe can do CPR? Raise your hand if anyone can do CPR. So we have a few, four, I think, four. I can't do CPR, um, but yeah, I might put that on the list. So Janie Lazar, um, Ted, our TEDx Dunleary, a previous guest on the show as well. Um, having family in New Zealand and a sister who's been in serious medical situations, I know that terrifying feeling that your parents would have gone through not knowing, maybe being too late and powerless and the feeling of relief arriving and knowing that someone you love has pulled through when you arrive. Um, so that was when you were bringing us through your parents, uh, making the journey. And then we got to you, you saucy pup, doing that to your mum with the uh, with the prank. And everybody's face in the cafe was like, I've got four kids. Like, you're after surviving a heart attack. I think I'd kill you there and then, do you know. And uh, Sarah said, I would have effing killed you there and then if I was your mum. And I could totally identify with that, Sarah. Um, so, yeah. And then James said, which I thought was hilarious. Thank you, James. I thought the bravest thing you did was wear a long-sleeved England rugby shirt in Betty's Town until you pranked your mum by pretending to be French. <laughs> Thanks for that comment. So yeah, look, I'm going to miss some, um, but there's some fabulous, as always, fabulous. Sarah appreciates your humour, that you have a brilliant personality and it could be the key to your survival. And she's also going to borrow that comment you said about finding a new North Star. Um, so again, having faced her own adversity, Sarah Ward really loved that, um, that North Star comment. And then Kristen said she loved the joke. Um, she's a nurse and she would do the same as what you did with your mom. Um, Janie liked the wheelbarrow and the image of barreling you along. And James then said, James Finnegan says, Dermo's keeping continents between you. And I think we know why. So like I say, guys, you know, Karen says it's magic. Thanks for being here, Karen. Karen's saying it's magic. Eamon has popped in all your, your websites there, Mark, your, um, your grad life and your own website. So um, people will hopefully access you there and, um, and, connect with you in whatever way you know um, Kathy Mara says you're wise beyond your years thanks for sharing your story there's so much I can take back to the kids that I coach I also coach sprinters in the spring and winter and um, so that's just fantastic we're so so delighted um, to have you here with that um, so uh, so and you've even put there Mark it's a long time ago it might be 11 minutes now you're something else you're here in the chat you're just a one you're fabulous and at that point I'm going to hand you back over to Colin, but you're brilliant. Well done. Thanks, Colin. I love that. I love that. And you got the kiss. You got the kiss blown by, from the princess. Woo! Tell you. Yeah, big shoes to fill. Whoever's coming in next. Uh, that, look, that was just gorgeous. That was just gorgeous. It, it really is one of my favorite parts of the show because uh, I get to sit back and listen to what the magic that's going on in the cafe. And it's this lovely thing going on. You and I are having the chat, like we're having a cup of coffee together, and the rest of them are earwigging best they can and listening in to see what they hear. And everybody's hearing the same words, but they listen with different ears, so they pick up different things. It's just, just gorgeous. By the way, uh, I just Googled it there while you were going through that piece, Shelley. Uh, so your man does uh, 100 metres in 11 seconds, right? 11 seconds. 
the world record was set by Usain Bolt, 9.58 seconds. <laughs> You're not doing a 100 metres and 11. Happy days, right? Come here, I think uh, the rugby field is probably a safer, a safer place now that you're not on it, dare I say it, because can you imagine that? Somebody smacking you. All right, listen, it's been an absolute joy, Mark, an absolute joy. I hope you've enjoyed, I hope you've enjoyed the experience as much as we have. Totally. It's been so much fun, and I honestly just admire, I said it at the start, but I, I mean it even more now. The little community you put together here is brilliant. Uh, that's, like, I'm going to join again. You just get so much out of it. Thank you so much, you guys. Oh, it's our pleasure, our pleasure. All we did was start it. All we did was start it. Oh, here's James Finnegan stirring it big time. Right. <laughs> uh, okay, listen, come here. It's been, it's been a joy. It really has been a joy, everybody. And thank you all for being here, as ever. It uh, makes every morning at 11 o'clock very special for us. Very special indeed. Okay, let me tell you what's going to happen in the cafe tomorrow. Uh, for those of you in the Midwest, this will make a huge amount of sense, but Dolan's Warehouse reopens tomorrow evening. After uh, months and months and months of, of lockdown, Dolan's Warehouse on the Dock Road reopens for evening at 5 p.m. And Mick Dolan is going to join us tomorrow. Mick is a legendary impresario and venues operator down here in the Midwest, originally from Dublin. And he's coming in tomorrow. He's taking an hour off tomorrow between 11 and 12 just to come in and have a chat with us and tell us the journey up until now, what it's been like pre-COVID, what he's hoping for. Uh, post-COVID and what he's taking from COVID. So please, if you've got time tomorrow, you know where to be. You know where we'll be, that's for sure. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure as ever. I want to thank Princess Shelley for producing today's beautiful show. Heart emoji. Thank you, Princess Shelley. Eamon Smith, a.k.a. The Monk, for keeping us safe and sound. Uh, lovely to have you here. And that mindful moment is very special and very important part of what we do. Thank you for that. And of course, Katrina O'Brien, equally as important, is the topping and tailing she'll do later this evening for hours to make this beautiful so we can share it out on social media. So thank you for that, Katrina. I want to thank wigwam.ie SME peer support for their ongoing support. And finally, finish the show as I always do by saying Mark Maxwell, Namaste. Namaste. Thank you, guys.